So, Jordan, obviously this new series, Dragons, Monsters, Men, the first one that we're doing together, this series is focused in on how men can be men. Why do you think there is such a crisis of masculinity in the first place, and why are there so many people out there who are angry at you for even talking to men? Well, I think it's... I think you could think about it as a consequence, in some sense, of the lack of a concept of original sin, oddly enough. I mean, people bear an existential burden, you know. It's an intrinsic part of life to, I suppose, to feel guilty in relationship to nature and to feel guilty in relationship to culture. You know, it's difficult for us to live in harmony with the natural world and for the natural world to live in harmony with us, by the way. And none of us are all we could be on the social front. And one of the consequences, and so we, we have that sense intrinsically, you know, that there's a lack in us that needs to be redressed. And unfortunately, that can be weaponized and has been. And what I see happening to young men in particular, boys as well, not just young men, and maybe even, you know, maybe starting at the age of toddlers, is that we have this sense in the world that human beings live in antagonism to nature and that we're actually a malevolent force. And that our social structures, which are clearly capable of the commission of atrocity, are fundamentally oppressive, patriarchal in their nature. And so then if you're a male in a society with that ethos, you're the motive force that drives you into the world to live is associated with rapaciousness and despoilation on the natural front. Bruh! What the heck type of words are you pulling out of your back pocket, man? I'm trying to follow along, bruh. I can't follow along you pulling out words like rapaciousness and propolosis. What the heck, bruh? Come on, man. You're talking to me, bruh. I, I get it. You are talking to Ben Shapiro. And y'all, and you're talking to a, um, a slew of other people who are extremely inte intelligent, and yeah, they might understand what the word means. Okay, shout out to them nerds. Y'all aren't nerds. Y'all are y'all are cool as hell. I used to disrespect nerds when I was younger, and then when I became older, wish I was a nerd. <laughs> Not a nerd as in you know the pocket protectors and all that. But okay, I'm talking too much. I don't know what that word means. I need to look it up. Motive force that drives you into the world to live is associated with rapaciousness, rapaciousness and despoilation on the natural front and then oppression and atrocity on the social front. It's like, well, then, if you're the least bit conscientious because this sort of accusation hurts conscientious young men the most, then the best you can do is, well, let's say castrate yourself. How would that whoa, be? Whoa, and that whoa. would be real comical, except that it's also happening. So I guess that's why, that's why I think there's a crisis. And it, 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 there's a, something serious at the root of it, right? Because we do have Greedy. to take the fact of our, the potential damage we can do to the natural world and the social world. We have to take that seriously, but the, the proper consequence of taking that seriously is not to commit Harry Curie, let's say, in a fit of moral anxiety and take yourself completely out of the game. But that's the insistence now, and it's really... And I see that psychoanalytically, you know, I see that as a manifestation at a symbolic level of something like... Well, symbolically, that's associated with the devouring mother, right? It's, it's an overweening and destructive false compassion that has this devouring quality, and... Yeah, and that's basically where we're at, so... So, you know, it's... Isn't it good to be a fly on the wall? Like, the internet is just... <laughs> the stuff that we're allowed to do nowadays, like, it's, it's far beyond anything we could have ever imagined 10, 15, 20 years ago. This is crazy. And these two kings right here, man, they sitting here, um, like, just intelligent AF, just talking to each other, and we're able to reap the spoils from their conversations. This is amazing, man. All right. You know, it's one of the things that's striking about the sort of hatred that you've gotten from so many is that you, you've literally been asked why you're even bothering to speak to men. I mean, there is this crisis yeah. of masculinity, right? There is yeah. this idea that 
every form of masculinity is toxic. And you've spent your life trying to talk to men and say, no, no, you can channel that masculinity in not only a good way, but a necessary and productive and, and useful way. And people have gotten angry at you for this. Where do you think that's coming from? Why, that's obviously a good thing that you're doing. Why yeah. are so many people upset with you for well, that? Well, the thing is, I never really set out to talk to men specifically, I, but I did set out, at least in part, to make a case for the utility of both the feminine and the masculine spirit, and it turned out that making the case for the masculine spirit was something that was more demanded by the culture, let's say. The anger, that's a complicated issue. We, we touched on some of it in relationship to the despoiling of nature and the idea of the oppressive and atrocity, atrocity committing patriarchy. But then there's another issue too, which I think is germane. Um, because of family fragmentation, there's a very large number of women who have, just like there's a very large number of men who have never had a real word of encouragement in their whole life. It's a really sad thing to see. It's a really, really sad thing to see, to see that deeply and to have seen that reflected in so many thousands of people. But there are many women who've never had a positive relationship with anyone male in their life. And so one of the consequences of that, we know, for example, that younger women are more likely to be attracted to men who show dark triad traits, narcissistic, Machiavellian, and psychopathic. And this dude, man! And he's talking about just research. This is actual research that he's picked up, man. But it's, it's the truth. It's the truth. Also, young, um, young men out there who have never had anyone affirm them or just let them know that um, all of the great things that they can do by simply being a man, or, um, and, and you know how positive it was and how far they can take it. The fact that most, of, well, a great many of us can go our lifetime um, through adolescence anyway and not have that affirmation from someone who is strong, um, intelligent, and, um, and, and, and positive. Um, that's unfortunate as hell. But we learn that through our actions. Sometimes when we don't receive um, certain things, while, while, while maturing um, or going through our own sugar honey iced tea, once we are in place to give those things that we lacked or that we didn't receive, we do it for the most part. I, know, I do know that that's how I'll, I approached my family. No one taught me how to raise a family. No, no one taught me that a man goes do, does this and a woman does this. Because while my wife went back to, she was working and going back to school, I was working and I adopted all of the, okay, so that you can finish school, I'm going to, I'm going to um, drop the kids off to school, I'm going to pick them up, I'm going to cook their, uh, I'm going to cook them some lunch, I'm, I'm, I'm going to make sure dinner is ready. Like I've done certain, I'm going to wash clothes if my schedule allows it, because I saw that she, one thing was, I got her, I got her pregnant at, um, at the age of 18 our first year of college. So me, I'm like, okay, um, I felt like it was my responsibility, it was partially my responsibility to make sure that she finished what I helped break away because she was on the four year college track. She was on that track. And because of our relationship, that had to slow down a bit when she you know, was at full term getting close to the pregnancy you know she had to leave school she had to leave and and so did i and i left so that i can work she left so she can take care of herself and everything and um and i one thing i said to her was you will finish school again and she went back and she didn't do it because i said it she did it also because she had a desire to finish but i had to do my part in order to do that saying all that to say this we learn from our past. We learn from our mistakes. We also create our own reality um, w when we start to mature. And hopefully young men can start to see that too. If things aren't going your way, you can create your own reality, even if you don't have a certain level of education or certain resources, those type of things. You're built for this. As a man, you're built for this. That's why when we go to the gym, yeah, we like to do leg day too. But most times we're pushing ourselves, you know, um, chest, arms, back, chest, arms, back, shoulders, chest, arms, back, and, and stomach as well because, um, because we really do have that capacity 
um, a lot bigger than we thought we had in us before we even went there. But when we start to put that um, um, that 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 pain um, on our bodies, run our bodies through all of those activities, we start to see what we're made of, and that makes us feel good. You know what I mean? That affirms ours. So we we affirm ourselves. That's self um, self affirming. We don't need anyone else to do it. But it's good to have someone. I know that was long winded as crap. My bad. Who show dark triad traits, narcissistic, Machiavellian, and psychopathic. And people who have those traits are characterized by the mimicry of competence. And so what women want in men more than anything else is competent generosity. And the data on that are very clear. But you can mimic that if you're narcissistic. And if you're a young woman, you, woman, you can be deluded by that. It's partly because it points to the problem of dissociating competent confidence from the expression of power, per se. So we could call power, I'll define that as the willingness and ability to use compulsion to attain your aims. Now, if you are someone who has a proclivity to manifest power, then that looks like the manifestation of both ambition and will. And if you haven't had the, a positive relationship with anyone masculine in your life, and maybe with, not even with your own internal masculinity, say, you can't discriminate between power and competent, the ambition that serves competence. And so, because that's terrifying, because the power, if you have na had only negative relationships with men, their, their capability to use power becomes such a threat that it has to be opposed at all costs, even if it manifests itself within the, say, within the developmental pathway of your own son. And so, so some of that's familial breakdown, and then you have a multi-generational pattern of that that makes it even worse. And so that's, that's definitely part of it. You know, there's an ideological drum that's being beaten constantly, both on the sociological constructivist front, right? That's the oppressive patriarchy, and then on the environmental front. And then you add to that the fact that, well, on the leftists, especially the radical types, their whole damn doctrine is the most pathological doctrine you could invent if you set out to invent a pathological doctrine. And I, I mean that, <laughs> I'm not making a joke. I, I, I really mean that in the deepest possible sense. The notion that the fundamental human motivation is the willingness and ability to use compulsion, power. Power. It's all about power. And every time I hear that now from someone, I think, that is not a sociological observation. That is a confession on your part. And so, and it's also just complete bloody nonsense. I mean, you, you, all, you all know this. You have friends because they're compelled to be your friends? Like, that's definitely not how you have friends. You might have bully henchmen that way, but you don't have friends. Power is an extraordinarily unstable basis to establish a marriage on. Plus, it just doesn't work, because it turns out that women, who are so annoying, are very difficult to <laughs> oppress, you know? <laughs> <laughs> bruh, you're going to get home and be in trouble, bruh. He said, who are so annoying. <laughs> Shout out to John Jordan Peterson. He's picking game, man. Hopefully you young people are listening. Hopefully you old people are listening too. This brother is smart as hell. But he's, yeah. Women, very so school. annoying, are very difficult to oppress, you know. So you can try, but it's not that easy. And I don't think that we've been all that historically successful in doing so. But it's also a, it's also a preposterous proposition because... because the expression of power within an intimate relationship does not produce intimacy or a relationship. The best it can produce, produce is a, like a combination of tyranny and slavery, and that does not characterize the institution of marriage per se. So there is this insistence among the, um, among the radicals that power is the fundamental motivation, and that's, and then you think too, Okay, you're only motivated by power. That means that we can only get along if our interests align, because if you're motivated by power and I'm motivated by power and our interests don't align... That's right. ...and there's nothing else but power... That's it. ...then the only option I have is to turn you into an enemy and try to destroy you, because we can't engage in dialogue. That's dialogos. I'm glad he mentioned that, because a lot of people who are extremely um, competitive out there um, in business or, say, if you're an artist, like I come from hip hop culture, 
um go go r b culture d dc dmv type of um um energy around our music um you're gonna have that i'm a go-getter i'm a hustler by any means type of mentality so sometimes indirectly we end up making relationships that way and with people who also have that same mentality and sometimes at the end of the day it's like if 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 I can't win um, by way of this con- this relationship, then and you can't win by way of this relationship, or if you can't gain just by having me as a a, a friend or something like that, then the relationship isn't there anymore. It's like then we become extremely competitive against one another, no longer supportive. One person is probably not supportive and the other person is, one person is supporting the other and the other person is hating the other. The other person wants to beat the other. Every time you put your accomplishment out there now, um, they're looking at that as a slight on them. They're looking at that as, are you trying to show off? You trying to stunt? You trying to, um, you trying to flex on me and show me that you're better than me? Okay. And then you won't you you won't hear from that person until they do something of note that they can now post all over the internet and brag about, if that makes any sense. I know I don't speak with the same you know um, pizzazz as uh, Mr. Jordan Peterson, but I hopefully that resonates with someone because uh, sometimes I have stuff in my head and I don't know how to properly get it out. <laughs> but I'm working on that. And the reason we can't engage in dialogue is because there's no logos. There's just power. So there's no such, this is why it's a good thing for conservatives to understand. You have to understand that the debate about free speech on campus, in the deepest sense, is not a debate about who should be allowed to speak freely. That's nothing. That's that's a trivial debate. You can even understand it in some sense. If I don't agree with you, maybe I don't want you to talk. But the, the debate is about something much deeper, which is whether or not the idea of free speech itself is just a mask developed essentially by Europeans Uh to justify the oppressive patriarchy in the most devious possible way. And the answer the radicals have to that question is yes, that's exactly what it is. And so there's, there's no free speech whatsoever. That's an illusion that's promulgated by people who are only trying to justify their claim to power. That's what the bloody argument is about. And so, and I just think all of that's and justify I, it's their claim wrong to in power. Every way. Wow. It's wrong theologically, it's wrong psychologically, it's wrong scientifically. Even chimpanzees who have a patriarchal social structure, their social structures, if they are based on the on power, on compulsion, they're unstable, and the alpha chimps who use power are very likely to meet an extraordinarily brutal and premature end. So Franz de Waal, the Dutch primatologist, has detailed out this. Wonderfully, he's shown that even among our closest biological relatives, it's the ability to make peace and to engage in reciprocal interactions that constitutes the basis for a stable polity, even among chimps. And it's obviously the case that that's the proper basis for social relations, especially among free people. And I've been trying to puzzle out, uh, especially in my lecture tour recently, what the antithesis to power is or to the will to power let's say in terms of arbitrary compl- this dude is a beast man i mean i can i can listen to him talk for for a really long time because he's the way he break things down is just <laughs> next level man smooth it's smooth he go from point to point to point very smoothly and then goes to another point ties them all in they're all tied in he speaks in context wow man that's this dude is a master communicator I'm trying to puzzle out Uh, especially in my lecture tour recently, what the antithesis to power is, or to the will to power, let's say, in terms of arbitrary compulsion. And it's something like the spirit of free and voluntary play. And that's a wonderful thing to know. It's so optimistic. You guys were talking Mm -hmm. about optimism earlier, you know? So imagine this, is that if you structure your relations optimally, and I mean optimally, with yourself, with your intimate partner, with your family, with your community, the highest level of attainment of that structuring is the manifestation of the spirit of voluntary play. And that's so lovely because there's nothing better than playing, fundamentally. 
And you know, human beings and other mammals as well also have a biological circuit that mediates play. That was discovered by a man named Jacques Panksepp, and he showed that play is unbelievably important to the development of children for a variety of complicated reasons, partly because they're practicing to be competent adults, but also that it can be suppressed by almost any other emotion or motivation. So your kids can't really play if they're hungry or tired or wet or wow. upset. And the same would apply within your relationship. If there's it's stresses true. and That's tensions, true. the play disappears. That's true. But if you optimize the relationship and the circumstance, then the spirit of play can manifest itself. And I would also say, that's also the fundamental purpose of fathers in some sense, is to imagine that paradise, that's a walled garden, that's what paradise means. So it's walls, structure, and then the garden inside is nature, and a nature that's tended. The, the masculine role in, in child rearing is something like the erection of the walls so that play can manifest itself within the walls. And that's a real good combination of security, because that's what the walls are for, but then the kind of freedom that allows for untrammeled development to occur in the most positive possible sense. And so I would say that those of us who are standing against the radicals who insist that the only human motivation is power can oppose that in part by putting forward the observation that the proper antithesis to that is the spirit of voluntary play. And that's what I hope we're going to do with the Daily Wire. Yeah, Jordan is a beast. Um, Jordan is a beast. Jordan Peterson is a beast. Um, and I didn't get a chance to, see, um, to hear um, Ben Shapiro speak that much, but that was the whole point of this. He wanted um, he wanted Jordan Peterson to to speak his piece, man, and and to help men because there is a crisis. There is definitely a crisis. I didn't have to get into politics and and all this other BS um, uh, like any of it in order to understand that men need to be men that those times are are waning even when i took up the mantle to do certain womanly duties in my house um, i made sure that my men my young men my boys that i was raising and am raising but i'm talking about when they were smaller um that they knew their roles as young men and they took on to them roles extremely um, um early and easily it was effortlessly no one taught me that but i guess when you're coming from a clean slate you can teach things how you believe they should be taught or you should um, try to get them to um, gain understanding so that it's as effortlessly as um, eff effortless as possible um and when they uh, when they meet certain things like certain um, um situations out there in the real world they'll respond in kind because you prepared them so this conversation is necessary it's necessary if you can do me a favor and share this i would appreciate it not so that i can get a whole lot of views but so that a lot of people could understand that this conversation is being had and needs to be had and um and they, and those there's certain ways about us especially men that need to that need to change um fact of the matter is we need to grow the hell up right that's pretty much all that I have. It's y'all turn now. I want to hear what you got to say about this in the comments below. And if you have yet to hit that subscribe button, please make sure you do so on your way out the door. Once again, guys, I'm Van. And now we are all the LFR family. And I look forward to seeing you in the next video, hopefully inside the Patreon as well. Y'all have been amazing per usual. Love y'all.